Every object in the Sanctuary of Diana has its story to tell, and the archaeologist's job is to piece these stories together. In many cases, the information we can glean from archaeology is complementary to the information we can glean from myth. Caterina Lorenz shows us one such piece of archaeology, and it's a piece of sculpture known as a herm. Now, what we have in front of us here is a so-called herm, a statue of um, a woman, a woman called Fundilia. Now, herm is, is the name for a statue which um, consists of a head and, and then a, a box-like shape for the body, so the body is not sculpted. It looks like a pillar, pretty much. However, in, in this particular case, the interesting thing is actually um, that the herm bit of this Fundilia statue is not just left plain in plain marble, but is actually decorated as if to look like a human body. So we see her breasts. They are kind of sculpted out of the, of the rectangular column shape or pedestal shape. And we also get a very good idea about um, the thing she wears. Her garment is very um, specifically rendered. And we can see that she's wearing something like a thin undergarment. And on top of that, she wears a little mantle or stole as it is called in, in, in Roman society. And these two pieces of drapery already indicate that we're dealing with someone from, from the upper classes, someone uh, of some standing, a proper Roman matrona, probably also like the female head of the house, the, the domina who runs the place together with her husband. The whole depiction of Fundilia seems motivated by a desire to give her gravitas and authority. Now, when we look at her portrait, it's quite interesting because um, she's got a very delicate face, but also a face which indicates that she's already quite mature. A lady perhaps in her, I don't know, late 40s, mid 50s, even perhaps a bit older. And her hair, it's also very, very peculiar because she has um, a fairly short hair cap when we look at her from the front. But then we can see that at the back, on top of her hair, there's a little kind of pile of hair, as it were. And this, is, this pile of hair is in, in, in Roman culture called a uh, tutulus, and that's interestingly um, a very old-fashioned type of, of hair coiffure. It seemed to have been very fashionable in, in the, the Republican period, 2nd century BC, as something the matrona would wear to indicate that she's uh, the female head of the household. So Fundilia had been given an old-fashioned haircut. The herm itself was an archaic form of sculpture which could trace its roots back to crude decorations of ancient crossroads. And it may well be that for this reason it was a deliberate stylistic choice for the sculpture of Fundilia. The process of deliberately making things look archaic is well known in Roman art. An artist would adopt an older style to convey a particular message. And the message must have had something to do with the person who commissioned the piece. In the inscription, we are, we are told that this is the depiction of, of Fundilia Rufa, but it, the inscription also tells us that this statue was put up by a, by a specific person, namely Fundilius uh, Doctus. Fundilius Doctus is a very interesting um, figure because from, from the archaeological record, we know that he was an, um, an actor. He refers to himself as a, a parasite of Apollo, uh, and a guest of Apollo, and this, this, is, this is like the trade name of actors in the Roman world. But he was rich enough, wealthy enough, important enough to put up a statue in the sanctuary, and uh, along with a, a big statue of himself and, and various other pieces, in order to document his position in society. Like many actors, Fundilius Doctors was an ex-slave. And this statue was a tribute to the woman who had once been his slave owner, but whom he now saw as more like a patron. In commissioning the sculpture, he was seeking to convey a particular statement about Fundilia. But he also commissioned another sculpture, which conveys a particular statement about himself. He depicts himself more like, a, like a, an upper-class Roman citizen, really, and, and shows himself as an intellectual. He has a book scroll with him and a couple of book scrolls at his feet, and, and he, he, he wears a toga, so his representation is actually not of, of a slave, but of a, of a proper Roman citizen. This may reveal another dimension to Fundilius Doctus' decision to commission the sculpture of Fundilia Rufa in a deliberately archaic style. He depicted Fundilia as if she was uh, his ancestor. And this is probably in order to create something along the lines of a family lineage, so that Doctors is not just the freedman of Fundilia, but actually she could just be his, his grandma. This is probably done by Doctors in order to, to show, look, I come from, from a background. 
we find this interest in, in, in family relationships and, and affiliation throughout Roman history and Roman society. It's, it's something especially kind of prominent in the funerary context where people have an interest, obviously, to make a point about what kind of background they come from. For successful ex-slaves like Fundilius Doctus, there were only limited opportunities to parade their achievements. Funerary monuments were one and votives at sanctuaries were another. The reason Fundilius Doctus chose the latter may be down to a personal connection. We know from the archaeological record that the sanctuary had a theatre attached. So one of the explanations for, for Doctus' interest in, in Nemi could be that perhaps he was actually someone who, who performed at the theatre, who was perhaps part of the, the group of, of actors who would um, perform at that theatre. So he was directly linked to the sanctuary of, of Diana and had a very direct interest in, in putting himself right there. Perhaps he was the most important actor at, uh, at Nemi, perhaps, and this is why he chose to, to depict himself in this place and celebrate his background with him. We'll never know for certain who Fundilius doctors and his fellow donors were, or what rituals went on at the Temple of Diana. But every scrap of evidence, however fragmentary, provides a social context for the original consumers of myth. And knowledge of this social context can only help us in our understanding of the myth itself. <laughs>